Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back, and if you're just joining us for Life Science Alley 2014, welcome. Uh, once again, I want to thank our premier partners, Medtronic, FedEx, Greater MSP, Mayo Clinic, and the University of Minnesota, as well as all of our sponsors, exhibitors, and all of you for making LSA 2014 possible. Thank you. Today you've had the opportunity to hear world-renowned payers, providers, companies discuss their approaches to reinventing the business of healthcare. You've been introduced to promising new technologies and therapies, as well as hundreds of individuals and organizations with highly specialized expertise. And hopefully, you've had a chance to catch up with many of your colleagues and hopefully make a few new friends to create business opportunities down the road. But the day is not done. We have what promises to be an extraordinary afternoon keynote, and after that, I'll get to spend a little bit of time with Medtronic Chairman and CEO Omar Ishrak to answer many questions surrounding Medtronic's future. Finally, when we end our session with Omar, we'll all gather back in the exhibit hall for the 30th anniversary reception, sponsored by 3M, and VWR International for one last chance to get together, share a cocktail, and reflect back on what the last 30 years have meant for our community and what the next 30 years opportunities present for all of us. Now I'd like to introduce Ed Black, President of Reimbursement Strategies and a longtime supporter of Life Science Alley. Ed has lent both his time and expertise over the years and joins us now to introduce our afternoon keynote speaker, Ed Black. Thank you, Shay. And I really sincerely want to thank Life Science Alley first and foremost for the organization they are, because I know my company wouldn't be where it is today without this wonderful organization. Many of you here know that before I started doing reimbursement consulting, I spent more than 25 years working within the Blue Cross and Blue Shield health plan system. And I had the privilege of working with some very talented, very conscientious health plan medical directors who fully understood and appreciated the fiduciary responsibility they have to the members that they cover to ensure medical policy development is not only clinically sound but cost effective. But a lot of these policymakers look at new technology much different than most of the people in this room do. A lot different than the FDA does, even a lot different than practicing physicians. My associates and I counsel clinics, uh, clients all the time to consider this perspective, but oftentimes the result of health plan policy decision making leave entrepreneurs like yourself confused, sometimes angry, and feeling like policy decisions are really arbitrary. To that end, the program that Dr. Bellinson is going to introduce this afternoon I think represents a major step forward in opening that black box of coverage decision policy making within the Blue Cross and Blue Shield system. Dr. Bellinson is the executive director of the, clinic, the Center for Clinical Effectiveness of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association headquartered in Chicago. It's a national federation of 37 independent Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies. She leads the operational and financial responsibilities of the center and is a part of the leadership team in the Office of Clinical Affairs. She focuses on the development of emerging programs and services that enhance clinical effectiveness for the independent Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans. Before joining the association, Dr. Balanson served as a National Institute of Health Clinical Cancer Fellow at Northwestern University where she developed and tested community-based models for cervical cancer screening, both domestic and international. She continues to serve as an adjunct faculty at Northwestern University. She received her bachelor's degree from Cleveland State University and a PhD in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina, and holds a master's degree in public health from the University of Pittsburgh. 
Dr. Bellinson is here this afternoon to introduce to this audience at Life Science Alley a new program of health plan coverage transparency called the Evidence Exchange. And my company is really pleased to be among the early inaugural companies subscribing to this important new um, program. So please give a really warm welcome to Dr. Suzanne Bellinson. Good afternoon. I really am quite pleased to be here and, and thank you for a very generous introduction and uh, I'll try and do my best to, to live up to the expectations that have been set out. Um, it's true, I, I went to the University of North Carolina and I, I got a PhD and I spent a, a good period of time uh, doing clinical trial work. Clinical trial work uh, mostly focused on cervical cancer prevention, uh, did uh, ran large trials both internationally and domestically looking at screening and diagnostic test development. So I'm quite familiar with many of the uh, operational issues that you all have as you work to take a product and build an evidence base uh, for that product. So I thought that I would start my presentation today with a little bit of a story because like many of us, uh, I'm a parent and I work and therefore I'm very busy. And I try and choose things in my life that uh, make my life more convenient and make my life more efficient. This is sometimes complicated by the fact that I have two children. This is my daughter, Olive. Olive is the youngest of my two children and she's extremely pleased that I was going to talk about her in my talk today. Um, in addition to her love of chickens, which is clear by the photo, uh, she also, like many other kids in this country, loves the movie Frozen. For those of you who have children or grandchildren or friends with kids, I'm sure you're all familiar with the movie. For her sixth birthday party, Olive wanted to have uh, a Frozen theme party and she wanted it to be at our house and she wanted me to plan it but most of all, she wanted the dress that the main character in this movie wears. Well, anybody who knows anything about the movie Frozen knows it was literally impossible to obtain anything related to the movie over the last year. So as a dedicated mom, I decided that I would call the Disney store and I'd go and I'd visit Disney stores and I'd look at online retailers to see if I could find the dress. But I always felt like there were pieces of information that I was missing that would actually make that easier. So I'd call the Disney store or I'd show up on my, you know, run over from my office and they'd say, you know what, we had some this morning, but they're all gone. Maybe, maybe when we get another shipment, we'll have a few. And I'd say, great, tell me when the next shipment comes. And they wouldn't say. When I'd look at the online retailers who you know, I was hoping would have a dress for me to purchase, it was unclear to me if I was actually looking at the real dress. The dress that when my daughter pulled it out of the bag, she would say, this is the one that everyone is gonna recognize as the real dress. So I was in trouble. I clearly needed some help. So I reached out to a friend of mine who I think is much smarter than me, and I said, well, what am I gonna do? The party is looming. And she said, I don't know what you're so concerned about. You're spending all this time running around, you're talking to all of these people, what are you doing that for? Haven't you ever heard of eBay? Now to those of you who laugh in the audience, you clearly know eBay created a marketplace where you could take buyers and sellers of almost any good, bring them together, and eBay would facilitate a transaction in a convenient, efficient, and very transparent way. Well, it turns out that eBay happens to be a very efficient, convenient, and transparent way to buy an Elsa dress. I did obtain the dress, and my daughter was thrilled because she pulled it out and she said, this is the one that everybody is gonna recognize, everybody's gonna love my dress. 
So now that you know that I got the dress, the question is, why, why did I tell that story? What does that have to do with why I was invited to come here today and speak uh, to you about a new initiative we have at the association? The story that I just told is a story of information asymmetry. It's a story about me wanting to obtain something, but everybody else seemed to have pieces of information that I didn't have. That if I had that information, it would have been much easier for me to accomplish my goal, which was about getting a dress. So we'll talk about how that story uh, really links to uh, the place that we are in healthcare today. So there's this quote by Roger H. Lincoln, and I don't actually know if, if it's a rule to success or not. But what I do know is that it does fairly accurately describe the situation we find ourselves in terms of payer and industry interaction. So plans end up knowing what the association says, right? So uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield plans know that uh, we've taken a position on, on a certain uh, technology. You may not know that. Um, and the fact that there are these, uh, th that there's this information asymmetry creates problems for you as you head out to interact with payers. So just like my story uh, of trying to obtain an ELSA dress, uh, the system of payer industry interaction is fraught with information asymmetry. So the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association uh, does medical evidence review. My, uh, I'll spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about uh, my shop and how it's structured and the structure of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. So the association, for those of you out there who are sports fans, and seeing that we're in Minnesota, I assume there are a few in the audience, the association is very similar to the NFL. We are an organization that centralizes certain capacity and licenses 37 independently owned and operated Blue Cross Blue Shield plans. Similar to NFL teams, our plans select their own staff, they make their own strategic decisions, and most importantly for our conversation here today, they make their own coverage decisions. Independent of each other, they make their own coverage decisions. So at the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, my group uh, reviews about 500 topics a year. We maintain a medical policy reference manual, which currently houses about 441 reference policies. We add about 50 to that each year and archive some portion of it. We do about 16 medical uh, technology assessments. Those are publicly uh, reviewed and, and uh, reviewed by an external body and then publicly released. And then we also have a set of reviews that we do of specialty pharmaceuticals that are coming through the FDA pipeline. And our job is to systematically review the published literature, publish documentation that then the blue plans can use as they create their own uh, local medical policy and coverage policy. Can you go back a slide, please? Thank you. Um, and so the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association publishes these documents. They are proprietary, currently proprietary to the blue system. Blue plans then use those documents to create their local medical and coverage policies, which they then release publicly. So you can see a blue plans policy but you currently can't see our documentation about the work that we did that may be a large part of the reference material that that plan used in creating their policy. You also hold lots of information about your products. You send, them to the, you send that information to the association, because I get it. You send it to plans, because I know they get it. 
but the people who are actually doing the review of your technology may not ever see that information. It winds up sort of in the wrong hands or at the wrong time, because we all know probably the most important factor that determines whether you review something that comes across your desk is timing. So if you're doing work on a particular topic and then a week later something comes across your desk about that same topic, the likelihood that you're gonna pick it up and read it is much lower, because now you've got other priorities. So the silos that we've created, BCBSA and plans and industry, the information asymmetry that exists and the lack of transparency creates a lot of confusion. In the world of medical evidence review, there are lots of stakeholders. For our conversation here today, we'll talk about Blue Plans, BCBSA, and industry. So Blue Plans interact with BCBSA on medical evidence. Blue Plans interact with industry on coverage. Now, it depends on which plan you're talking about to the extent that that interaction occurs. But there are many plans who have very organized processes by which they interact with industry representatives around coverage. Others have very closed door policies. So uh, again, it's, it's a continuum that, that is the choice of, of each blue plan. But the association has not historically interacted with industry on medical evidence review. And we, of course, don't interact on coverage because that's not in our purview. Coverage is a plan choice. And further, as I said, plans are turning over their and making public their medical reference, their medical policies, but yet you're not able to see background information that they may have used to construct that policy. So at the association, we've been thinking about this problem and thinking about what it is that we can do about it. What we think we can do about it is to create an association-based document that represents a common evidence review, a document that can be leveraged by both plans and industry to facilitate communication between the two. This is the concept behind the evidence exchange, a common medical evidence review that can be leveraged by blue plans and industry for, to facilitate interaction on coverage. So like eBay, the association serves the function of bringing together in a marketplace uh, blue plans and industry to post and retrieve information uh, for future interactions that they will have uh, around coverage. I want to just pause from the story for a minute to be very clear uh, about a few things. The Blue Cross Blue Shield Association has always accepted uh, information from industry that they wish to have reviewed as part of our process. I get dossiers every day through email, through regular mail, and I reply back and say, thank you. I will pass it on to the team. We will incorporate it into the next annual cycle. And it is always incorporated into that next cycle. The evidence exchange represents a new paradigm. This is a subscription service that is not going to be right for everybody because the value of this is not about coverage for any one single technology. The value here is being aligned with a vision that is about creating efficient and convenient and transparent communication between payers and industry to create efficiencies within the healthcare system. That is different than coverage for any one particular product. So what is the evidence exchange? What does it do? The evidence exchange provides industry subscribers access to the Center for Clinical Effectiveness at the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association in a few very important ways. 
So as we discussed, we currently are reviewing over 500 uh, policies or, or technologies a, a year. But you don't know when. And because you don't know when, the timing issue of when something might cross my desk is a big problem. So I'm reviewing a technology on Monday. On Friday, you send a dossier. Well, now the timing's off. Same thing happens at a plan. A plan reviews a medical policy on Monday. They get your dossier two weeks later. Well, they've already made a decision. The timing's off. So the evidence exchange offers access. Through an online portal, you have an opportunity to review uh, our book of business, essentially. See all of the policies that we review on an annual basis and pick and choose what you might want to track. This provides you then with a calendar that you can populate with the dates of those uh, technologies that you're tracking. It also provides you with the date by which you would need to submit information to us to have it included in this annual cycle. Allows my team to review any evidence they have and review your evidence at the same time. Once you've decided that you want to submit information, you'll be able to submit that information through an online portal. Easy. You submit that information one time, and it's available to BCBSA, and it's available to all the Blue Plans. So as medical directors at Blue Plans review the update of our policy, your dossier or whatever format we choose for that submission is now housed side by side. Again, timing is everything. So they review our update. They have the opportunity to review your material at the same time so that as they make a decision, everybody's on the same page. Once you've submitted your information, you'll be able to track it. So you don't have to call me. You don't have to waste time sending me emails. You don't have to wonder about where it is. You'll be able to track where it is in our process. And then once we've reviewed your submission, we'll send you a document saying, hey, you submitted 10 articles for a review. We included five, and we excluded five, and here's why we excluded them. We think that this is an incredibly important feedback piece that is, that is missing currently. Um, so currently, uh, people submit information to me all the time, but because we don't have a process to feed that back to you, and a method for feeding that back to you, and buy-in from those who we're working with that the feedback is actually going to matter, um, we don't currently do it. So you submit, you know, as Ed mentioned, this concept of, of a black box. You submit into a black box because you don't know the date. You're taking a shot in the dark because you really don't know what our evidence review said to begin with, so you don't even know where to target your submission. So this gives you all those opportunities. After we've then reviewed your evidence and any other evidence that we've found through our literature search, we will provide you uh, an evidence summary. This evidence summary, we think, is one of the major pieces of value uh, through the evidence exchange. This is what allows you to truly understand how we at the association view the body of literature for any particular technology. We'll tell you how we see the body of literature, We'll tell you where we think the gaps in that evidence lie, and we'll give you some ideas about how you could move forward to address those gaps in future research and future submissions. It is essential if we are going to continue to ask for high levels of evidence, which I guarantee we and other payers and other health technology evaluation groups are going to continue to drive you towards a place where you generate high levels of data to show that your technologies work, it is only fair that we tell you if you're meeting the mark. What we're not going to do is provide you a checklist. This is not do A, B, C, and D, and we're going to change the way we view your technology. That's not going to happen. But what we are going to do is provide a roadmap and say, 
here are some ways you could go about doing this. Here are the types of outcomes that you've currently measured and here, or that are currently measured in the literature, and here are the outcomes we think are missing. Now, you absolutely have every right to disagree with us, but at least you know where we stand. And the plans know where we stand, you know where we stand, so now you're able to move forward and have conversations with plans who have medical policies that may, they may not, but often they have a large portion of their evidence base which is based off of ours. So now when you walk into that meeting with a plan, everybody's on the same page. They know what you know, you know what they know, and we all, everybody knows what we say. It doesn't mean that we are um, any authority over any other body who would review this type of work. We're one group, but we are the group that do it for the blues. And we actually think, when you look across uh, plans or, and other health technology groups, we're all reviewing the same data. Most of us are asking for the same types of data. So we really see this as an opportunity that while we're starting within the blue system, uh, there really are uh, opportunities to build this in, into a, a broader application. So what does our timeline look? What are we doing? How can those of you who are interested get involved? I would say that if any of you out there say, this is something I'm interested in, the concept of working together with a payer, with other folks in the industry to build a system that can create clear efficiencies for the way I do business, I'm interested in that. I'd urge you to talk to me. We are in the process of putting together a group of early adopters. It is a small group, and it is my choice who is in that group because what we are looking for is a group of people who are highly motivated to work together to build this system. And as I said, it's bigger than coverage for any one technology because this applies across the board. And that group of early adopters have an opportunity to lock down some of the key operational features of the evidence exchange uh, between now and when we will have a public launch in the middle of 2015. Some of those operational features are, uh, so I told you that we're going to report back uh, an evidence summary to you. Well, what's the format of that going to be? What's the evidence that you really want to make sure that we feed back to you? That's a really important piece for this group to work through. Another important piece for this group to work through is the format by which we will accept information. Right? People use all sorts of different types of formats to put together dossiers of clinical information. We need to come together as a group and decide uh, really what is a standardized format uh, for this uh, online portal system. And there are many good ones out there. So whether we create our own or, or choose one of the existing uh, will be decided by the group. Um, as I said, we will publicly launch the evidence exchange in the middle of 2015. Um, it is unclear at this point uh, when we will open the evidence exchange to additional groups. So uh, we're very clear that we will not add more than our set of early adopters at least until the middle of 2015. And at that point, we'll decide whether we're going to stick with that group through the end of the year or if we think there's an opportunity to uh, expand it to another set. So then beyond that product launch, really what we're going to be focused on in 2015 is thinking about how do you enhance the product. So this online portal, this is version one. And I think we've gotten a lot of interest about it, and there are a lot of interesting ideas about where do you go next. For example, people have asked uh, me today, so how do you interact with specialty societies? How, how, how do you work with providers? Uh, how do you work with other plans, other payers, other HTA organizations? All of those things are extremely interested for us to interesting for us to explore because when something gains efficiency in one realm and you're doing that same task in multiple other areas, you can only gain more efficiency if you can sort of wrap it all under one umbrella. So what are the next steps? Well, next steps for people who are interested is, is talking to me about uh, seeing what the term sheets look like. 
On our end, we're developing a webinar series that will kick off in December for those early adopters. And then we'll move forward to contracting folks for 2015. We are extremely excited about this. We believe that it is an absolutely new way to look at uh, the way in which to evaluate technologies. One thing that I think is extremely important for me to make clear is that we have worked very hard to ensure that my scientific team who is evaluating these technologies on a daily basis remains free of bias that a system like this can introduce. So um, my team who, who evaluates the technologies will be blinded uh, to the fact of whether the information they're reviewing came from you or came from a search that we did on our own. You will have an opportunity to interact with myself and other scientific leadership within the Center for Clinical Effectiveness who will then be able to carry your message uh, to the team. This firewall system we think is essential for the success of the evidence exchange and the protection not only of our staff but also of those who subscribe because the market is incredibly competitive. We think this is an advantage for those who choose to participate, but we want to be sure that there are never any questions out there about, uh, well, you know, you're a member of the evidence exchange, and, and what, what, it was, what did that team, did you talk to the team? You'll never talk to the team. You'll talk to me. You'll, you'll talk to other scientists, and we'll be able to walk through important clinical issues that you think are affecting the way your technology is being reviewed by my group but I'm not gonna invite you in for a marketing presentation. That's not what we do. The other thing that is extremely important that I wanna talk about here today is what the evidence exchange doesn't do. The evidence exchange doesn't solve all problems. Just like you know, I was able to uh, retrieve this ELSA dress from eBay, but I still had to plan the party. So, just because the evidence exchange will gain you some efficiency, you still have to plan the party. You still have to generate the data. Because my group lives and breathes data, and without data that shows me that your technology works, there's nothing I can do for you. I, I, can't, I can't help you because I don't live in a world of proprietary information. I don't live in a world of unpublished research. I live in a world of rigorous research that has been published in the peer-reviewed literature so that I can take that, I can review it, and I can put it back out to the world and say, here's what we have to say about this technology, and guess what, it's great. And I got this, they got the studies to prove it. So we think this is a game changer, but it's a game changer for those who say, we want efficiency in the process because we want to ensure that we're generating the best data we can in the most efficient way we can so that we can get our technology out there into the hands of providers so that they can uh, serve their patients better. So that brings me to the end of, of my presentation today. I really, truly am just thrilled uh, for having been given this opportunity to come and speak to you. Um, and, and I look forward to talking to anybody who, who has questions. Um, you know, qu questions are great, and, and, I'd and I'd love to take any of yours um, and speak with any of you who, who are interested. I think that there are real opportunities here. Um, and, and again, thank you very much. Ed, for the invitation uh, to come and the great introduction here today. Thank you.